welcome everyone. I'm super excited to be here with Elena and Brian today. I talk about growth, uh, growing through non-growth markets, a whole bunch of things we're going to cover today. Um, we're really excited because uh, we're launching a growth leadership program uh, in this upcoming cohort. I encourage you all to check it out. Elena was heavily involved in building it. I think it has a ton of insights. We'll preview a couple of those, um, but really we'll try to get into the conversation with Elena and Brian. To, to kick it off, um, I'd love to introduce our guests here. Um, maybe Elena, I'd start with you. Um, I'd love to hear just like, how would you describe your professional background? Um, and I'd love to understand just like, what's one uh, obsession? What's been your latest obsession recently? Um, just to bring bring that to life a little bit. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Vernon. And uh, nowadays I do growth advising as my full-time career option. Although I sprinkle in interim executive uh, engagements um, that I do in order to operationalize some of the learnings that I have through my advising clients. But I specifically focus on B2B and PLG growth models. Um, and uh, I love it across acquisition, retention, monetization, you name it. I'm also a content creator, program creator for Reforge. I've been with Reforge for many, many years. I was one of their first EIRs, uh, which was very exciting, transitioning all of the teaching away from Brian and scaling um, that. I created a program for experimentation, for monetization, uh, growth leadership uh, is launching uh, this spring. And we have a PLG program also in the works that is gonna launch this fall. Uh, very excited to be here. And and uh, one thing that I'm super excited about on the personal front, I'm a CrossFit addict. And right now is CrossFit open. And the second workout is going to be released in three hours. So I cannot wait. I have known you for like three years and never knew you were into CrossFit, which is really rare for people who are into CrossFit. You usually pick that up right away. One um, thing I've I know, learned I try about to keep it to myself. One thing I've learned about Elena is she's always got, you know, there was a phase where chickens were the obsession and there was another, not like, like Elena's, Elena's full of, of a bag of tricks. So you, you gotta, you gotta keep, you gotta keep up to speed with her. I'm learning that. I did have 11 chickens. Um, I love chickens. I might be getting more. Um, that's awesome. Brian, how about I turned over to you? Would love uh, for you to introduce yourself and tell us what's your latest obsession. Yeah, I'm Brian. I'm a founder and CEO of Reforge. Um, I'm thankful to Elena for being one of the first EIRs and taking the teaching over from me. You are you are all much better off for it. Uh, but um, prior to prior to Reforge, I was VP of Growth at uh, HubSpot, helping them kind of develop their um, multi product portfolio as well as start to institute a bunch of PLG stuff there a long time ago. Now it was like seven eight years ago. Now I'm getting old. Um, anyways, my latest obsession is, uh, uh, I mean, I've got kid number two, a lot of sleeping problems. My obsession has become all of the different theories of sleep training. I am now, I think very like well-equipped. However, I can tell you none of them work. <laughs> so at least on this sun, at least on this sun, none of them work. Uh, so I might have to invent my own, a new program, uh, just for Reforge for those of you struggling with the same thing for me. Other than that, my French bulldog named George is my other life obsession. Um, the first and original kid. You heard it here first, Reforge sleep training coming spring 24. I will be the first to sign up for that program. I'm right there, right there with you, with my daughter. Um, all right, let's jump in. Um, I know we have a lot to talk about here. Um, I want to start, you know, one of the topics we get all the time is really about um, how do you lead growth teams, uh, especially when when times are tough, when the markets change. And that's a lot of people are experiencing that right now. So I wanted to start and just highlight a couple perspectives from the Reforge front before we get into the Q&A um, with Elena and Brian. I'm pulling a couple things from um, the upcoming program on growth leadership. So I'll share my screen here. I'll walk through this pretty quickly. But when we talk about growth work, we're often talking about acquisition, retention, monetization. These are kind of the three big themes from the growth series, which is our longest running programs. Um, but when we talk about the growth leadership, we usually are up leveling a little bit. And uh, in our growth leadership program, we talk about growth motions being kind of product led growth, marketing led growth, sales led growth. How are you approaching these different aspects of growth? Um, and I think Elena, you're the one who put this out in a really great table where you can kind of map these things out for your company. You can say what parts of your acquisition, monetization, retention strategy are product-led, marketing-led, sales-led. And you can see you know, product-led acquisition, users acquiring new users versus sales-led where outbounds are acquiring new users. You can kind of map this out. And I think um, one of the roles of a growth leader 
is really to understand uh, and determine when and how it might be right to stand up a new growth motion, to make that bet into shifting maybe from marketing-led growth, marketing-led acquisition to product-led acquisition. I think one of the really common ways that growth leaders do this is introduction of product-led growth or specifically product-led acquisition. I'll bring in one example that we talk about in the program from Adam Fishman, the former head of growth at Lyft, where you know Lyft, when he was working there, um, was very product-led in terms of their monetization and retention, but their acquisition was really heavily driven by paid loops, um, referral programs to drive that awareness and activation. And one of the things that Adam and his team did was introduce these product-led acquisition features that looked like tracking rides, splitting builds, sharing, sharing rides, all taking the ability for one person's product usage to get new non-users non into the product and become users. Um, so I know a lot of growth leaders are looking for this right now. They're looking for opportunities to stand up new growth motions, but that's a complicated thing to do when you're in a down market, when the economy is difficult. Um, and specifically, the challenges you're facing are, one, um, cash is not readily available. Cash is expensive. VCs are valuing cash over this growth at all costs mentality. That directly leads to an increased focus on near-term goals. So there's a pressure to prioritize short-term revenue. It's difficult to justify investments with long payback periods. Things like standing up new growth motions generally have longer payback periods than doubling down on stuff you have. Um, what that means is the market changes can weaken your PMF. You will be tempted to double down on what's worked in the past to hit short-term numbers uh, in a cash crunch world. And meanwhile, user behavior could be shifting underneath you and you're not investing in modifying your strategy and your growth motions to uh, adjust to them. So this leads to something that I'd call the PLG vicious cycle. Um, and you see kind of a common trend um, that happens that looks something like this. It's like, we need something to help us hit our next quarter's numbers. Um, everyone is investing in PLG. Um, maybe we should invest in that too. That's the growth motion. Let's stand that up. That's the popular thing. Um, but then people get impatient and they see, okay, well, PLG isn't really working and paying off in the short run. How much are we investing in that? Um, that leads them to think maybe let's shift PLG resources to sales. Let's close some accounts. Let's hit some short-term goals. Um, and then maybe we scrape together an okay quarter, but we're worried about the next. Uh, we're not set up well to continue this growth. We're just kind of getting by. So what can you do? I mean, you're in this situation where you have this short-term uh, need and this desire to have long-term compounding growth. Um, let me offer three quick strategies uh, before we get into Elena and Brian's opinion on this. Um, one, what I call just like a blank slate redesign. Um, this is where you go through the exercise of rebuilding your strategy from the ground up to see what still makes sense today. And I think when it comes to revisiting core strategic assumptions, most teams iterate on this top 20% of those assumptions, but never touch the bottom 80%. And sometimes, and Brian, I think this comes from you, like you need to take a shot at throwing everything out the window, rebuilding from scratch, making sure all the pieces add up together, talking to customers like you're a new company. Is the problem the same? Do we have the right acquisition loops, the right monetization model, all of those things? You might get to the exact same spot that you're at, but at least at that point, you can move forward with conviction. And I think approaches like this may be the only thing to break you out of short-term thinking and make you realize that clinging to growth motions, um, that you may be clinging to growth motions that have diminishing returns. Second tactic I'll cover is adopting what I'll call a state-specific strategy. And this is tailoring your response to market changes based on your cash and strength of PMF. And this is a uh, framework from Tom Tungas um, over at Redpoint. Um, he has an awesome blog. Um, this comes from it. I think it's a really great framework. And essentially um, talks about you can map yourself in a market change during a recession on two dimensions. How much cash do you have and how effective is your sales efficiency? That's essentially a proxy for how strong is your PMF. And if you're in the bottom left, um, this chewing gravel, like you're in a tough spot, you're just looking to survive. But I think if you're in the upper right, the tendency might be that you want to change to the market condition, but you have an opportunity to stay the course and start to build really good long-term compounding effects while everyone else is changing their strategy. Um, I think that puts you in a really good position. If you're low cash, but you have kind of strong PMF, you have two options. One, you can go big and you can just raise uh, capital, even if it's expensive, even if the environment isn't great and really drive growth, or you can sacrifice short-term growth to uh, become profitable and be more solvent that way. And then this last category, this time to strategize, the bottom right, this is the bucket where you have to focus on efficiency. You want to cut extraneous costs. You want to maximize your runway and look to develop your product and your go-to-market uh, strategy as efficiently as possible. So I think just looking at where you are helps you understand how much do I need to react to this environment versus jumping to quick conclusions on what you need to do for your strategy. All right, last one. 
um, protecting long-term investments, talked about this short-term versus long-term thinking. I think great growth leaders set guardrails to protect longer-term growth initiatives to ensure you can build sustainable growth. You don't want to be in a position where you're surviving now, but uh, that by, by surviving now, it's leading to you dying in a year or two. You want to have some consistent focus on longer-term growth that can yield compounding returns. And this is how I'll pull Elena in here. Uh, this is a quote from you. Um, hopefully I got it right, but I always set a simple rule that 20% of my resources should be long-term focus. It can't dip below 20%. That specific number might look different for every company, but you know you should know where that line is. And I think as a growth leader, you have to be in a position where you can defend the most important long-term events uh, investments against near-term pressure that your company faces in order to let them mature and yield compounding returns. So that's a little bit of Reforge's perspectives, just some tactical views on what the challenges are and what some of the strategies are. But I want to um, take this opportunity to shift it over to Elena and Brian and bring their perspectives in. Um, and maybe Elena, I'll start with you. Um, you've said before that when market changes, when you're in a down market, um, it actually shouldn't force you to change your strategy. And yet we see lots of companies changing their strategy. So can you say why that is? Goal of growth team or growth efforts, goal of the sustainable distribution strategy in the company is to create, a, create predictability, sustainability, and competitive defensibility. That should be the case whether you're in an up market or down market. So the fact that there are so many people that are all of a sudden shifting and taking a step function change in their strategies to me signals that the incentives uh, were incorrect before, because you should always be driving for profitable growth. You should always be doing short-term optimizations to capture and hit the forecast this year, and then laying down foundation for long-term growth for next year, next three years for you to optimize and capture revenue then. So it's, it's interesting to me that people are so jerky when it comes to the down market. I appreciate that you might uh, invest or reprioritize um, some of your activities to double down on their revenue capture now. Uh, but at the same time, we should always have been focusing on profit focusing on predictability and sustainability from the beginning. And if we have to make that big of a shift, I think uh, the previous incentives of the markets and VCs have really run away from us and prioritized just growth at all costs or just growing usage without connecting it to monetization or growing monetization that is not necessarily sustainable because not all revenue is good revenue. So I do think that this is gonna be a really good correction for us all. I just hope that when markets recover, because they will recover eventually, that we don't go back into the trap of just chasing after usage or bad revenue numbers. And this will be a really good reminder for us to stay focused. Brendan, right. you're on mute. Like yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I like that. I think uh, it is kind of that sense check of of what we maybe should be doing all along. I think very few companies were being as disciplined um, on that, like you say. Um, Brian, I'm curious, you've been through a couple of these different downturns most recently with kind of the challenges of COVID. I think a lot of growth leaders took a lot of lessons learned from the COVID downturn they went through. Um, what's the same and what's different about the market today? Um, what can people build on that and what do they have to approach differently? Yeah. So I think the fundamental question everybody needs to be asking, um, not just now, but um, kind of in any sort of environment uh, where the environment change is like, uh, what are, how have the needs, problems, desires, and constraints of my target audience changed as the result of anything that's kind of changed in the macro environment? And so um, I think a framework that uh, I've come to love that um, Bengali Kaba, one of the other original EIRs with uh, Elena, um, created was called the adjacent user theory. Um, and uh, you can just Google it or we'll, we'll drop a link in too. But if you could just like imagine a bullseye, uh, like a, a series of concentric circles, right? And sitting at the center is like your like ideal, ideal most target customer, the one that's like the perfect fit. You know, over time, what our whole job is in like the growth teams is to keep expanding to the next layer of the concentric circle. And that's kind of the adjacent audiences. And as you move out, you know, those things that I mentioned, those needs, those problems, those desires, those constraints um, kind of change a little bit uh, every time you move out of wrong. And so you need to constantly be adapting in order to 
to push out. And so in normal environments, you can kind of move out progressively. Um, but, you know, bringing this to like COVID versus now, COVID, what that did for many business is, is that it either killed like complete segments and audiences and adjacent audiences, or they pulled in adjacent audiences that were like multiple rings out, um, you know, in this layer of concentric circles. They were like three steps away before. Now they're just like, they're in the center of the bullseye. And so rather than a progressive change in a normal environment, I think a lot, what a lot of people had to go through was like more of a fundamental change in terms of how they were thinking about and targeting um, in, in bringing in, in acquiring customers and, and retaining them. I think in today's environment is probably a little bit more subtle. Uh, it's very likely that the needs, problems, and desires, and constraints have changed. But I think for the majority of folks, it'll probably be adjustments rather than complete rewrites. Um, but regardless, the whole the whole point of this is that I think in times of constant change, you need to like have your ear close to the ground, constantly be reevaluating these things on a consistent basis, um, especially with the uncertainty. I actually think the most difficult variable right now is not necessarily like the teams. I think a lot of teams are feeling like the constraints may be doing more with less less resources. It's actually just the uncertainty of the amount of time uh, that this lasts. And that's the variable that feels like the turd in the punch bowl because it's just like how it's it's very hard. I think what Elena will talk a lot about is like how do you how do you think about balancing short term versus long term and really thinking through the, those investments. I, I think it just becomes real like a little bit more difficult when you have no idea how long this um uh the, like this environment will will last as part of that. And Elena, I'd love your perspective on this. I know, um, you know, I'd be curious to hear just like this versus COVID, this being something that's prolonged a lot more and maybe had a less acute shift than COVID did where things changed more suddenly. Um, does that make it kind of harder or easier to navigate from a company perspective? We had similar webinar a couple of weeks, maybe five to eight weeks after COVID hit two years ago or three years ago. And it was very interesting to me. I was at Miro at a time as their interim CMO. And uh, we had this very much adjacent user expansion happen versus Miro before was just for remote teams, which were a very small percentage of the market. And all of a sudden Miro found product market fit in everyone because everybody went remote. And we had to have that step function change of just saying, we're blowing up all of our goals. We're blowing up all of our roadmap. We're changing all of the messaging. We're changing all of the campaigns. We're going all in to capture this adjacent user. However, in the down market, um, there's no such event that is a step function change. It's a slow evolution that is happening, but it's happening a lot faster than they would normally happen as a, your adjacent users are changing. So I think some companies have felt it a lot earlier. Some companies are starting to feel it now. Some companies are yet not feeling it and are going to feel the pressure of the down market um, still in the future. So I actually think this is a little bit more of a dangerous time because you might say, oh, we're in the clear, our business is still doing good, even through down market. But that's not necessarily going to be the case still potentially three to six months from now, because different segments are feeling the impact of down market at different times. So it's the gradual change that is happening. And the biggest thing that I would pressure everybody to do is to reevaluate those hypotheses of how is down market impacting your business, not just once. I'm sure you've already done it once and you've had some sort of conversations internally, but do have them every three to six months just to make sure that you don't miss a moment if it starts to decline. Uh, it's going to be a lot more gradual and that, cre that creeping in of, that, uh, of those trends into your metrics um, can create a lot of panic. So try to keep your eyes out and look at majority of the key predictors indicators. Revenue is an outcome. It's a lagging indicator. Do not look at revenue or whether your business is still doing good or not. You need to keep a very tight uh, grip on your key predictive indicators um, across uh, not only traffic to impressions, to signups, to activation um, and engagement. You said 
don't look at revenue there, um, which I understand, especially from the growth leader perspective. But Brian, you're in the unique position of being you know, a founder and a CEO. I'm curious, uh, does the perspective change at all from the founder and CEO lens? Um, what's going on in the heads of founders during markets like these? Yeah, I think... Um... I think it doesn't matter like what role you're in. I, I think we'll probably have people in this on this thing that are founders to growth leaders to on the growth team. But I think always trying to understand like what is the conversation that the executive team and the CEO might be having? Like how are they thinking about the strategy and working backwards towards like how your initiatives and things ladder up to that is like always like an important um thing to be going to be going through. I would say that um you know, not the comp just the conversation inside Reforge, but what I see in a bunch the conversation that, that's happening in a lot of companies that I'm either an investor or an advisor are is like if you well, first I think we got to break it down into into three categories. There's like series A and earlier, there's like mid-stage series B and pre-public, and then there's public companies. And I think depending on what type of company you're in, the conversation is fundamentally different in all three of those. I would say series A and earlier, uh the conversation has actually hasn't changed that much. Like the biggest thing that has put, put put a lot of pressure on founders and CEOs is that a lot of people raised at certain valuations a year ago, more greater, those have corrected in an extreme fashion in a very like short period of time. And to the early, early stage companies, they're they're probably the least affected by that because um they've raised the least amount of uh, they've raised the least amount of money, typically at lower valuations. Um, they're kind of going through a product market fit exercise. There's like a whole bunch of other components um, to it. Uh, and so I actually think the strategy there is just, if you can, is like, you know, keep plugging away, um, keep trying to to grow a little bit, keep working on the product and kind of wait out uh, the market a little bit. And that's viable for like a lot of companies in that category. The mid-stage is the hardest. It's it's the hardest, and to a certain degree, like it is just the messiest and the most chaotic right now. And the reason that is is that um, since valuations have dropped so dramatically for that segment of everybody, what everybody is trying to do, the conversation in the boardroom is avoiding the down round. The down round means that you raise at a lower valuation than your last round. It's very. Uh, it's extremely hard for a company to work through that. It ends up diluting a lot of the existing investors, the existing founders, um, the existing employees. It's just like, it's a shitty thing. I've been through that in one of my previous companies before, and it just sucks. And so everybody is trying to avoid that. And the primary thinking is that to avoid the down round, I need to lengthen my runway. To lengthen my runway, I need to cut costs. And to cut costs, I'm going to cut things that aren't paying off right now. And what that leads to is often cutting some things that aren't paying off right now, but they're going to pay off in the midterm, a year or two years from now. And so you get a year out or two years out. And even though you've extended your runway, you aren't creating the growth to avoid uh, the down round at that moment in time. And so how you avoid this trap is like, is the most complicated conversation that's kind of going on in tech companies right now. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of companies where the down round's probably inevitable. And, and, and those are companies that are probably still good companies. There's some good fundamentals there, but because they raised at such a high valuation and things have corrected so hard, like it's just out of whack, it's just, it creates an impossible math scenario. And so for those companies, I actually think the hard decision there is like, rather than optimizing for avoiding the down round, which you fall into this trap, this loop, there are some companies that should probably just accept it. And, um, and that's actually, uh, that's actually the better path and to make sure you're kind of, you know, balancing the, these like short-term and long-term, um, uh, the short-term and long-term bets and basically just start planning for how you're going to mitigate the consequences uh, of of a down round rather than it you know falling like you fall into this bad loop in in your in your growth strategy public companies i don't know i'm actually interested i think elena actually has more perspective on that than i do at, at this point so i don't know if how does it, how elena from your perspective how is the conversation different in the executive rooms of those companies uh 
for me, the fascinating piece about public companies uh, is that they actually heavily investing in long-term growth now, which is uh, they're a little bit have better scale. They already have some profitability going, so they're not dependent uh, so much on the next round to extend their runway. They usually have runways of five years seven, 10 years plus, uh, depending on their profitability model already, or they are much more in control of their expenses that they know how to tighten it to create extended runway without having to suffer consequences of uh, lack of lack of funding. So even though evaluations are down, I've been very pleasantly surprised by how many public companies are going and investing in growth motions like product led, really going after freemium, really thinking about how they're gonna create revenue a year, two years from now. And honestly, they have unfair advantage over startups and mid-markets because they can afford to do that and they're taking advantage of it. The only other thing that I would say, uh, Brian, to what you uh, already mentioned is that, first of all, I'm so happy that we've killed the metric of multiple on the next 12 month ARR. Like I've seen VCs actually come up with a brand new metric of giving companies 100 and 150 X multiple on their revenue and saying, oh, but if they hit their next 12 month ARR goals, then it's going to be only 25 to 30. So first of all, hallelujah, next 12 month ARR multiples are gone. Uh, but at the same time, I think the earlier you are, especially if you are around A or even before A, the biggest thing that I would recommend focusing is connecting that usage and product market fit to monetization as soon as possible. Bootstrapping is back in, be able to be profitable from the beginning is hot trend all of a sudden back again. So that's amazing. I love working for bootstrap companies because they're so much conscious about how to acquire, engage and monetize a customer, but really weave in monetization model as part of your product market fit. I think uh, the days of just going after usage and thinking about monetization later are gone um, and really focusing on how you will be able to connect it either to self-serve monetization or uh, sales monetization becomes the key. So I'm excited about this trend. I think it's so much more sustainable. Elena, just building on that, you know, you mentioned that PLG specifically, kind of one of these growth motions that's uh, really in vogue right now something more and more people are turning to, but few are getting right. Um, so in markets like this, um, what mistakes are you seeing in companies turning to PLG? Why can't they get that right? Biggest mistake, so what is PLG first of all? Product-led growth is all about your ability to self-serve activate a customer, ability for you to create retention loops, so ability to engage and retain in a habitual manner. And most importantly, which is the last step connected to monetization. Whether it's a self-serve monetization or sales monetization actually does not matter, but that you're able to create self-serve usage that is connected to monetization. That is product-led growth. However, you cannot start with monetization. If you're not able to self-serve activate or self-serve engage, monetization is not gonna come. The benefit of PLG is that it qualifies the customer for you through product usage. It almost like it displaces an SDR or sales development representative that qualifies the prospect, but usage qualifies the customer for ability to monetize. Now, if you look at it, the sales led motion, which is another very popular one, let's just hire a bunch of sales folks and have them given key accounts and have them go at it. You go after an enterprise buyer, and if you're going after an enterprise buyer, you are demanding much higher ACVs or average contract value because you have so much cost loaded into in order to find that enterprise buyer, wine, dine them, convince them to actually purchase, and then you have a PLG. PLG and SLG, so product-led growth and sales-led growth, fundamentally attack different life cycles of the problem. Product-led is meant to come in with the user at the very low complexity of the problem and escalate to the point where enterprise or entire company is feeling it to close that enterprise contract. Versus sales-led motion goes after enterprise problem right away. Well, first of all, if you're comparing contract values of PLG and SLG, that's not apples to apples. And many finance um, departments or strategy leadership teams in the companies, they look at, oh, PLG only grabs $25 a person versus in SLG, I can close $200,000. Let's kill PLG. Let's just hire more people and focus on SLG. 
Well, that's really not a fair comparison because you entered an organization much earlier and that $25 user will never be able to close $200,000 at that point in time. So it's ability for you to enter into organization sooner and graduate to that $200,000 contract, but it's not a fair option for a user to either buy 25 bucks or $200,000 worth. So I see people just comparing the monetization or especially first land contract across PLG and SLG as apples to apples, please don't do it. These are meant to really surface different uh, complexity of the problems on different timelines for the organization. And then second of all um, is expecting that monetization too soon. PLG takes a time to figure out how to self-serve activate, how to get really great activation rates, how to get engage engagement rates, and then how to connect it to monetization. So if you set it on your OKR cycle, in the next three months, we're gonna launch a trial or a freemium, and we wanna see how much it improves our pipeline. I'm sorry, you are gonna, you're destined to fail and you are gonna sunset PLG before you even gave it a shot. So I would just be very cognizant about comparing different growth motions from their initial monetization potential because PLG and SLG just are not comparable. And the number two of your expectation of when PLG will, will really pay out because you can hire a salesperson and they potentially can close for you hopefully within a quarter to hit their quota. PLG does not work that way. You really need to create trust. You need to create um, perceived value with the customer, with the user before you're able to monetize them. There's just a little bit longer runway, but it is more sustainable in the long term. Elena, can you just, you know, I think we've talked about how PLG can be a little bit of a, a, a slower boil. For those who are venturing down that path, um, what is the expectation that you set with your clients of like how long it's going to take to see, see results. And if, I don't know if you have like any milestones that, that you t typically think about. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, I would say that I start PLG always, or at least I advise to, to in that 20% long-term investment category. This is not going to be a program or initiative that will help us hit our numbers this quarter. It needs to be going into, this is a long-term investment, and if we get it right, we'll be able to monetize it very effectively in the next year to three years. So I started as no monetization expectations. Let's just see if we can activate. Let's see if we can even acquire customers. Is there a demand on the market that we can capture with self-serve activation? Can we engage them? Can we prototype of how we can monetize them? Monetizing on PLG is... Um, harder product has to be able to sell itself. That's not how we usually position our teams. We have product that builds the products and then hands it over to marketing and sales to sell. And here all of a sudden the pressure falls back on product, that product needs to monetize itself. That means product managers actually need to understand monetization model, make decisions about monetization model. That means product team has to have accountability over revenue all of a sudden or some sort of KPI into revenue. And that takes a while to figure out and that shift can take as much as a year. We've been uh, working on PLG with Amplitude for the last year as I was their interim head of growth. It was in their uh, last earnings call that they're really doubling down on product-led growth as their next um, initiative. We've been working on it for a year. Lots of failures, lots of learnings. We thought it's going to be a quick shortcut. It wasn't. It opened up a bunch of other customer issues that we need to solve and product experiences that we need to resolve. It's a long-term game. So um, be in it for at least a year, minimum of a year, to see some green shoots. Uh, it's really an exercise that will start paying off in spades in two to three years if you start right now. Yeah, it was years for us at HubSpot. Until we really, until it started making meaningful impact on the business, it kind of also depends on what your denominator is, right? Like I think HubSpot was already at 100 million ARR, so impact is all relative to that. Plus, that was like nine years ago now, and now there's you know way smarter folks like Alina advising companies to help them accelerate that uh, accelerate that path. But it is a it is like a year, yeah, it is like a multi year uh, year journey. Yeah, it strikes me in some of the questions people are asking, um, like what, how, how do I convince, you know, my C-suite that MRR is a lagging indicator? Another said, just like, thank you. I wish my C-suite was on here for all these kind of rules of thumb and uh, all these kind of timelines that you're putting out. 
do you have any practical advice on like how to drive executive alignment towards some of these if you're in a situation where people are over-focusing on short-term goals and under-investing in some of these longer-term initiatives? Well, I think any revenue metric is probably a, is an output metric. And it's common that the, the C-suite, the executive team are focused on the highest level business metrics and like the outputs and like monitoring all of those. And, um, and I like, I think, I, I think there's a lot of situations where like, I think the, the C-suite understands that those are lagging indicators. And so I think if you're somewhere else in the organization, it's more about like making sure that you understand, like you have conviction on what input you are moving and how that ladders up and affects the output. And you are communicating that relationship uh, as well as the dynamics around that input. Like, um, it, it mean, it, dynamics meaning like, um, there are certain inputs that are easier to move than others and reasons why and I think getting like really crystal clear about that communication and that expectation and beating that drum is, um, is, is, I, I think is, is just like a, is just a big piece of it. Um, but I've seen a lot of times people fall into traps of like trying to convince the executive team of like, ah, it's not about MRR. It's about this. And yeah, that is, that's true to a certain extent, but you know, the, the, a lot of executive team, especially in a big company are they're they're kind of steering a ship and they're kind of looking at a dashboard of dials. They're not necessarily like in the engine room monitoring, you know, the oil level of a, like a specific part. Right. Uh, so anyway, I, I, that's probably a bad analogy, but, um, I, I don't know if Elaine, if you have anything to add to that. I have two tactical uh, advices. Number one, befriend your finance department. By 100%. befriending your financing department, especially CFO, if you can have CFO behind this type of investment, you're golden. You're going to have a runway. But in order to befriend finance department in these types of initiatives, you need to build bottoms up forecast. So not a forecast of the revenue, and we're just going to apply 20% month over month growth to it, and then all hands on deck, let's go hit it. No, bottoms up forecasts, always starting with prospecting traffic to your website, to signups, to activation rates, to engagement rates, to monetization on top of engaged uh, users, to product qualification, to um, sales leads that you'll be able to create. If you start building up that forecast and saying, hey, these are the first early assumptions that we need to test. And then we still, now we go up the ladder all the way to monetization, then you can create predictability for the team to say, hey, are we moving in the right direction or not? Are our hypotheses correct or not? But um, without finance team, I think it's almost impossible. Uh, fp &A should be your best friend um, and CFO should be your biggest supporter. So I would really figure out how to tell the story in conjunction and partnership with the finance team because then uh, things just start end up happening uh, right away. Um, there's a question in here about um, can, you know, is it always product-led growth versus sales-led growth? Can they coexist? And Elena, I know you've talked about this before and really building that bridge from product usage to sales qualification or uh, sales-led growth. Um, can you talk through like how those two can coexist effectively? So there's three major motions that you can have on growth front. There is product-led growth, uh, there is marketing-led growth, and then there is sales-led growth. And those are the three columns, so to speak, and rows that you can answer with those motions are acquisition, retention, and monetization. That's that chart Brandon showed um, a little bit earlier uh, when he had some slides up. Your goal is actually to play across all. You should be product-led, you should be marketing-led, and you should be sales-led. Your goal is to play across all of the motions, because that creates most competitive defensibility. Now, some of the motions may be very offensive to you. This is your unique differentiator. This is your wedge into the market. This is what you're really good at. Some of them might be just defensive, like paid marketing. I wouldn't necessarily advocate for anybody to be very offensive on paid marketing. It's just, it's a very expensive exercise in the long term, and it's not very sustainable, although you can have really good loops going. But should you be defensive on the paid marketing if somebody's bidding on your brand term in your competition? Absolutely. Throw some money at it. Like be marketing-led on acquisition to defend um, yourself from competition. But 
it's not a question of whether you should be PLG, product-led growth, or whether you should be SLG, sales-led growth. The question is, is how you can do both. And that creates the most defensibility because it addresses different parts of the life cycle of the customer, different problem complexity, different segments in the most efficient way. And the bridge between product-led and sales-led is product-led sales, just to PLS, just to throw another acronym at all of you. Uh, PLS is really where you generate demand with product, but then you capture it with sales versus traditional sales-led growth, you de generate demand out there in the market with marketing and sales, and then you capture it together. So I think combining the two is um, a really nice bridge between uh, product-led and sales-led as to not create two completely separate silos in the company, because uh, both product-led and sales-led require quite a bit of difference in how they're implemented and executed internally. But your goal and destination should be how to play across all of them. The question is, is just in sequencing and prioritization. That's super helpful. Um, we're going to go to some user questions in a little bit, but as we are scoping this topic and getting some input on it, um, one topic that consistently came up, that's probably no surprise to anyone here is uh, chat GPT and how that type of trend, this like very emergent trend is affecting growth strategies. Um, Brian, maybe I'll ask you, you know, um, can you talk about how you see ChatGPT, um, generative AI, changing growth strategy at different companies today? Yeah, I'm actually going to present a bear in a bull case, and then I'm going to have Elena <laughs> choose her case and prediction. I'm going to avoid the prediction. So, uh, but I think um, I wrote this blog post a long time ago, like probably like 10 or 12 years ago. That was titled like new channels create new opportunities. And the fundamental principle of that was that when a new major distribution channel emerges, it tended to create um, a whole new set of uh, successful companies um, in the same category, right? And so a long time ago, the categories I was comparing is like, you could have looked at gaming, for example, and seen the evolution from um, like web and banner ads to the Facebook platform and social to mobile, right? And and it was never the companies in the last, you know, in the last one that kind of, that transitioned and dominated the new one. And that's because of this concept of product channel fit, which is that you actually build your product to mold to the channel. And so it's um and so it's not like you can just like switch the channel like real like real quick and um and everything will be okay. Even though we saw that so many different times, like in the in the switch to mobile, a lot of like these social gaming companies or dating apps on 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 these social platforms and stuff would just like copy and paste their product into mobile, and it didn't work, right? It like wasn't really it wasn't really designed for it, right? So so in with that in mind, right? The the bull case is that hey, we're going through some disruption here. Right. Um, you know, chat GPT, other AI products getting to hundred million plus users in a very short period of time. Very clear, very clear that there's going to be some type of disruption here in how users interact with um certain channels. Uh, and as a result, that disruption is going to create new opportunities, even though we might not see it yet, right? You know, because of that fundamental principle of product channel phase, like still a little bit too early. I think the bear case is that, um, um, uh, maybe I got those backwards. The bear case, the negative case is that, uh, is that actually what ChatGPT is doing in some of these like natural language, you know, UI uh, uh, companies is that it's actually not only like not, creating a new channel that people can tap into it's actually taking some away right it's taking traffic from search you know attribution is abstracted away from these responses right even though i i know bing is changing that a little bit if you have used bing ai yet there's like no desire to like click on the on the links and all of that kind of stuff and so it's not only it's not like a net neutral change it's like a net negative change uh, on the other case. And so that's like, that's the bear case. And you look at that and you're like, ah, crap, 
Like what, what are all the other second order effects of that? Well, you know, if search traffic decreases or these other marketing surfaces decrease, does that force everybody into an even more concentrated set of channels and marketing surface areas, more saturation, like all that kind of stuff? And how do you respond to that? And so I think that's like, to me, that's like the bull and the bear case. And we're, we're still waiting for, you know, it's still like so early in the game. We're not sure where it evolves. But I'm interested, like, where's your head at on on this, Elena? And what, what's the conversation you're having with your companies? I think, so first of all, uh, I want to talk specifically about B2B because I think uh, ChatGPT has a huge implication for B2B acquisition efforts. Most of the B2B companies acquire through company-generated content loops. They create blog posts, they create white papers, uh, gated assets, eBooks, um, and that's what their even events at some, at some capacity webinars, and that's their top of the funnel uh, acquisition strategy. All of that is about to go away. Why would I ever download an ebook if I can just go to ChatGPT, ask my level of complexity question, and I get a bunch of answers that are a lot more tailored to what I need to know? I think we are about to see a complete breakdown of all of the white papers, ebooks, downloads, and all of the assets from companies, unless they're able to offer something uniquely differentiated versus what ChatGPT has to offer. But I think that will take a while to figure out. I think user-generated content becomes a lot more valuable because those are proof points and they're personal and they're connected to an actual experiences about the customers. And we like to have that third party validation, but first first uh, party company content, if you rely on your blog as a means of generating content, as a generating acquisition, as generating demand, um, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be worried about it. To me, that's a much bigger disruption to a lot of the B2B sector compared to down market having right now. And not enough people are paying attention. I still see marketers that haven't even tried ChatGPT and they're still writing blogs as a summary uh, pages of what they've been able to research through agencies and freelancers. Beware because you're about to lose traffic like there's no tomorrow. And if you're not coming up with plan B of how you're going to substitute it, I think it's going to be a rude awakening. Do you substitute or do you just like hard, hard pivot? I think there's going to be a rise of creator economy where you have to attract your own audience because you have a very specific angle. I also do wonder what it's going to do to creator economy because ChatGPT or any of the AIs right now do not give credit to creators. So it actually takes incentives away from creators to create uh, any additional content um, and post it if ChatGPT is just going to rip it off and give an uh, anonymous summary of it. So I, I do think there's doubling down on the channels that are working outside of your company generated content for sure. But I do think really thinking about thought leadership angle and what unique aspect and uh, angle that you can bring to the market is going to be the key as opposed to just the vanilla. I'm going to hire an agency and they're going to create a blog post for me on this topic just through their own research. Uh, like that is going away really quickly and not enough companies are, I think, addressing it because uh, they're thinking it's more of a, either a blip or they're just not aware that this, uh, this shift is happening. I do think it's interesting that there's like dynamics on both ends here, which is that it will enable more creators who couldn't be creators before. Yes. Right. And on the other dynamic, it's, I think it's actually two things. It's not only, you know, the abstraction of the source, but it's just like, there are limits to the amount of things that people can consume, <laughs> you know? And so if you just like flood the market with more, like that doesn't necessarily equate to, you know, growth uh, um, for, for the company. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting dynamic on both ends. I want to make sure we can get to some of the questions people have asked. Um, and maybe I'll start with one that got highlighted a couple of times. Elena, I think you mentioned uh, the, the concept, not all revenue is good revenue. Can you just expand on what that means? Um, what does it mean to be, uh, to be not good revenue? Let me give you a very specific example. If you oversell, 
to your users, that's not a good revenue because that creates a lot of issues with your ability to have price transparency. That creates a lot of utilization and churn issues. And then you start to be in a downward spiral of just chasing more and more revenue because you don't have a really good utilized revenue to, to go after. Also potentially monetizing on adjacent use cases that are too far away from your core monetization model. Even though you can grab money from them, does it mean you should? Because they might distract your product development. Uh, they might distract you and really have a, more of a shotgun approach where you start losing your product market fit across core use cases because you're chasing all of the adjacent ones. So I think What's better to define is what is good revenue. Good revenue comes from your core use cases in your core segments, in your core markets. You constantly want to try to expand that through adjacent ones, but really pulling in adjacent ones too soon or overselling to companies, even within your core use case, creates um, downward stream effects that are usually felt more in a year time frame that can really drag the company down. But Brian, I know you've talked a lot about bad revenue as well. Um, maybe you have something to add. I think the story that I always tell, um, and uh, which I think is a good one, which is you know uh, HubSpot around Series B. This was a couple, like a year or two before I got there. Um, basically, you know, company was company was growing, but average churn was just too too big. And, and when they, when they really dove in, what they found was that they were actually acquiring four different types of customers, um, on this product, uh, on, on the marketing product at the time, there were like some very technical marketers that wanted to like customize everything. You had your enterprise marketing leaders that, you know, wanted a whole set of stuff. You had your mid market marketing leaders and you had your like very small business owners, and what they actually found, it, like as they segmented that and then started, what they started to look at was, um, was not just CAC to LTV because some of these segments actually showed like okay, like CAC to LTV. Um, but what they were really just looking at was going straight to the heart of it was um, just basically the retention and expansion on these different segments. And what they did, what they found is actually, hey, this mid-market persona like showed a fundamentally different behavior around retention and expansion. And that was the best leading indicator for the long, long term. Right. And um, and even though it was like a portion of those of of like that overall audience, they reoriented the entire business around that one segment. Um, everything, the product, um, the messaging. Uh, you know, the sales team and how they were comping the sales team, um, like all of these different components. And, um, and then, you know, that just led to like much better, um, that led to like much better economics and more focused strategy uh, over time. And so it's like one of these things that even though a certain segment might be showing some revenue growth in the short term, and okay, like CAC to LTV, I think, you know, looking deeper down into that around, um, especially like retention and expansion, because that's going to be your longest term. Um, that that's what creates the really long term durability. Is uh, it like that kind of like leads the way? It shines the light. Uh, is is probably how I'd best put it. There are a few questions here um, on B2C. I know a lot of things we've talked about, um, maybe if we contextualized in, in B2B, but um, this one from Dinesh, um, what would the PLG for a B2C business with good PMF look like? What learnings can we take from B2B PLG tactics? There's a couple others here on, you know, in a B2C product, how do we inquire engage, and engage users without monetizing them? Um, do you all have any specific advice for um, PLG in a B2C context? I want to just say first that we are in B2B are looking up to you all in B2C about what PLG is all about. It's not the other way around. So let's be clear. B2C has been doing PLG since inception. How do you acquire a consumer? You are give them a very amazing value prop. You should lead with value and then you monetize after perceived value increases to some uh, connection. The only reason B2B PLG exists is because we used to only sell to enterprise buyers. There was no users in the equation. 
that led to vast underutilization of the products um, because enterprise buyers were not effective and efficient and uh, into uh, gathering all of the demands from the employees. So then employees started going and searching for their own solutions. We in B2B are going through transformation where the decision-making is going away from enterprise buyer into down to a user. That's why we have a concept of PLG because we were all sales led before. You all in B2C, PLG is in your DNA, I would say. Maybe marketing led, obviously a lot of companies and consumer are very marketing led, but we're learning from you, not the other way around. I just want to be very clear. <laughs> I mean, I think I would summarize as the, the, the things we talk about in both the growth series and advanced growth strategy program and reforge are um, at, at the center of the equation is that you have to have some form of a viral loop or some form of uh, a content loop that the product is driving. There are multiple variations of both of those categories of loops. So it's actually much more nuanced and deep deeper conversation than just saying, I need a viral loop or like, I need a content loop, something something like that. Uh, like too much to cover here. But I think as you've kind of seen in the market, the, the, se the section of consumer that's been hammered the most are all of these consumer subscription app companies that don't actually have one of those things and have been mostly driven by paid acquisition. You see this in like, you know, some of the consumer meditation uh, like in health space and all that kind of stuff. And what you actually see those companies doing <laughs> is a lot of them are creating, trying to create B2B businesses now, uh, like masterclass is like another one, right. Um, because of these dynamics and all of these other disruptions, like Apple's whole, like AT and T thing, which kind of killed the, like that, that whole channel. And so, um, so once again, it's one of these things where, you know, the market giveth, the market take it take it away, and this is and that is a segment that is uh, um, definitely like you know being being hammered right now, and all of those companies are actually trying to reorient their strategy, and a lot of those reorientations are actually trying to you know create a B two B line of the business and 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 um, and go that direction to get the retention and other dynamics they need. I know um, with this growth leadership program we're launching, uh, we're bringing in a lot more of the people aspects of managing a growth team. And Chris had a great question here. Um, Non-growth periods can be especially hard on team members on growth teams, layoffs, changing goals, objectives, customer behavior. Um, I'm curious to hear which things um, you've seen to be helpful with keeping folks engaged, retained, and executing at a high level when so much is changing. I do see some companies laying off their growth teams, it's very peculiar to me that they just decide to hire salespeople or something instead of actually investing into creating sustainable growth. Um, I think to me, the biggest shift that I've seen in growth specifically is more focus on monetization. I know I've already mentioned it before, but growth is starting to take actually accountability of monetization. I think it's very exciting. It's a new area that you can learn where you can actually connect acquisition to engagement to monetization as opposed to previously, most of the growth teams were either acquisition focused or maybe activation and engagement usage focused, but not necessarily how do you actually generate um, money out of it, which really br breaks down into three different areas. How do I create monetization awareness? How do I reduce friction in monetization? And then what is actually my monetization model with value metrics, use cases, um, scaling um, of the price points and so on. So. I would say the motivation is a really create that data map that maps all of these KPIs together to the final, really have a lot more focus on this is short term versus this is long term investment. The fastest way to lose motivation on the growth team, from my perspective, is never to focus on long term and just chase after optimizations, which is a downward spiral. And then the last of all, um, really start pushing your team to taking accountability of a monetization. It's really exciting projects and um, and. They're hard to figure out, but that's also what growth teams really want to do. I would just say, like, it is hard. And there's no way around it, right? Like, I think a lot of people, like, try to soften the message, soften the, like, the impact, like, all that kind of stuff. And I actually just think that prolongs the reality of facing the problems. Um, that's my brutal, I think that's my brutal, honest things. I know, the, I know the layoffs like impact like real lives and like all that kind of stuff, but it's, um, you know, uh, it's hard. 
and it is what it is, is kind of the combo. Well, I know we're at time. I'd encourage everyone to check out growth series, growth leadership programs from Reforge, um, maybe to, uh, to see us out here. Um, one question from Ole for a quick hot, quick hot take for both of you um, talking about chat GPT and acquisition channels. Does this mean SEO as an acquisition channel will be dead soon? Curious for each of yours hot take uh, as the last question. I think company generated content that is distributed through SEO is going to be on a major decline. I think user generated content through SEO is still going to see not only stability, but potentially an uptick in demand because chat GPT never recommends specifics. It says in general, or there's lots of variables. So people will start going and looking for their specific use cases still on search, but any generalistic content uh, that you create, I think um, there's a, there's a dead end to it. Yeah. Will there be a fundamental change to how things are done today? A hundred percent. Right. Um, will like Google and search traffic disappear? No. Right. So uh, all these things are gonna, all these things are gonna evolve the types of content that that's being, um, indexed, how users and what users search for on Google, these AI interfaces are gonna evolve. They'll probably play with like different like attribution stuff. We just kind of just don't know. Uh, like it, we, it's it's hard to say at this point, but I, I do think for sure it's going to fundamentally change um, the playbook that everybody's been running, you know, for the past 10 years, which is just basically choose a topic, aggregate the top 10 blog posts from the search results, parrot other people's content, play this constant game of telephone. That's dead and thank God, I am so happy for it. Thank you both, uh, Elena and Brian. Um, really appreciate your time. Uh, really enjoyed talking with both of you. Um, take care, everyone. Have a great rest of the day, great rest of the week. And again, Growth Leadership Growth Series, two of our programs will be running this spring. Um, check them out. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. Bye.